и Кириллов to give an introduction to quiver gauge theories, but uh, Shurik is not here, and it's... Um, I also asked. I also asked? OK. Ah, damn. Uh, well, it's uh, it's a big subject, and uh, so it's like introduction to condensed matter physics. No, it's <laughs> actually, if you Google the world, uh, the, the the world of quiver gauge theories is pretty large. Um, in fact, uh, they were studied by physicists uh, for a very long time, originally under the name of, I think, Moose theories. It's probably in the 80s. Our Georgia, so when people were doing model building, tried to find the uh, um, ground unify theories and the way they can uh, reduce to the standard model. Actually, the standard model is an example. Uh, of the quiver theory. I, actually, I don't know, uh, maybe Ami knows. Why, why, why were they called Moose, moose diagrams? What's the resemblance with the Moose? It has horns. It has horns. It has all of these uh, horns. It looks like arrows. Okay. <laughs> this was a, a, you know, a counter uh, name to the penguin diagram. I see. OK. Well, penguin diagrams are Feynman diagrams. Uh, and of course, yes, there is this famous story that uh, somebody said that uh, uh, they don't look like penguins. And then somebody said that Feynman diagrams don't look like Feynman, but people use this name. <laughs> so, and, and so, but the moose, moose diagrams were supposed to look like, like, like moose. Not anymore. So, well, maybe D, the D type, in the, for the fine D type, you can find some resemblance to the moose. I don't know. I don't see it. Anyway, um, another uh, sort of motivation for the quiver gauge theories comes from lattice. Gauge theory, and also from, uh, if, in a sense, from condensed matter models, lattice models in condensed matter. So your space time is discrete. And you have a gauge freedom. So you have some, um, sp uh, well, you can think you have some vector space sitting at each node of your discrete space time. And the uh, gauge fields Live on arrows. So here you will you want to specify the orientation of of the graph, uh, orientation of the arrows connecting the vertices of the graph. So this is and the dimensionality of space time is encoded essentially in the incidence matrix. So the uh, if you are in D space-time dimensions. Then you have um, 2 to the D edges. Passing through a vertex, sort of an average, and so the gauge fields would be the elements uh, 
will, you, will, you will assign to each vertex a vector space, let's say c to the n. So in the, in the, in the discretization of the ordinary gauge theory, all the vector spaces are isomorphic. And then uh, the gauge field is, is, a, is a matrix, which acts from, uh, from vector space assigned to, to the source of the edge. So it's target, and then uh, the gauge invariance it's a product of a vertices of the symmetry group which is assigned to the vertex, which is uh, well, actually it's a unitary it's an element of a unitary group. So this, these spaces are Hermitian vector spaces. And um, I guess there is some reality condition imposed on these homomorphisms. And then, uh, so there is an action. So it's an action, it's a functional of in the space of um, lattice connections, which has to be invariant. So it has to be G invariant. For any H which belongs to the gauge group. And then the. The uh, long-standing problem is to find a good, good approximation to the young yields action. Study, study the path integral, where you integrate over the space of, of the gauge fields. Mm. So. So this is a vector space, so it has some natural translation invariant measure. Sorry, this is not the vector sp um, Sorry, this is not what I meant to say. These are uh, um, so there is a unit, uh, there is a reality the reality constraint which I which I mentioned is uh, so these are. Unitary maps, in the sense that, so if you have a, so you have a map, which is assigned to the edge. It acts from from the vector space at the source to the vector space at the target. Then the adjoint map, which is defined using the Hermitian structure, takes you back. And so the condition is that this is equal to one at, at each uh, edge. So this is the. Um, so the space of gauge fields is actually it's a sort of it's a nonlinear space sitting inside the vector space, which consists of all uh, maps obeying this condition. And so the there is a measure on this space which is uh, essentially the product of Haar measures on, on the unitary groups. So in lattice gauge, th gauge theory, people study these integrals on the computer. And they, the way they behave as you make the, the lattice larger and larger and tune the parameters of this action. So the simplest action, which was proposed by Ken Wilson a long time ago, was a sum over all Plaquettes, so it's a square which you can draw. Uh, small, the minimal square you can draw on the, on the lattice. And then you take the trace 
of the product of the unitary matrices along the plaquette. There is, a, there is a obvious ordering you can employ. So your condition imply all the U, E, R isomorphisms? Yeah. That's right. That's right. So you can generalize. You can study the theories with matter. Uh, you can relax this condition, make use complex, uh, just complex maps. And then uh, add the potential, for example, which uh, <coughs> and S will be S Wilson. something like trace I'm just writing ad hoc formula which it's a function which whose minimum mi minima are the set of matrices obeying this condition so you sort of relax you, you relax the strict uh, unitarity basically you you complexify your gauge fields in this way so this is a kind of a lattice theory Scalar in adjoint representation. So there are many generalizations. Uh, there is a long uh, battle with uh, making spinners sleep on the lattice. I will not go into this. We had we had talks about this at this uh, in this auditorium. So um, can I make a question? Yes. So and if you refine the partition, the, this lattice that you have, and you keep on refining it. And you compute. So you, there is some you can you have to put some coefficients here, which uh, which will depend on lattice size. Okay, but will the answer when you compute up uh, in values of observables and endpoint functions and things like that be too different when you? I mean, is there some convergence statement that can be made on? For some observables, yes. So that's that's the that's the claim about the existence of a scale of the continuum limit. OK. So uh, today, uh, I want to talk about field theories for which the space time is continuous. But uh, there is some structure, like this slider structure, on the space of fields. And uh, apart from the uh, original motivation from people who, of people who just try to, to look for reasonable models, um, just generalizing what was already observed. Uh, now these, there are motivations which come from the string theory, and more precisely the deep brain physics. So uh, what do we need to know about deep brains? Well, deep brains are places where the open strings end. And uh, so uh, the thing which is interesting about them is, that is when you have a deep brain with multiplicity, with multiplicity, so n brains, the open strings come in uh, various types, which are labeled by the pair, pairs of individual brains they can end on. So open strings become uh, n by n matrices. More precisely, the space of the spaces of states of these open strings uh, are uh, n by n matrices standard with some infinite dimensional uh, algebra. And um, so you get uh, 
when you study the, the way these open strings split and, and join, and the way they interact, you will see the uh, various terms in the expansion of uh, the standard gauge, gauge theory Lagrangians. So the standard Well, there are two standard gauge theories we know of. So one is the young Mills theory. So this is that's the, the way mathematicians would write it, but for for the purposes of, of these pictures, of the same pictures, you would write that A is really a matrix of, uh, you would just think of this as a matrix of, of matrix of one forms. And so when you expand this, you will see the terms like D, A, I, J, D, J, I, plus uh, things like So, so I'm, I'm writing here the matrix indices explicitly, plus and so, so this term in the Lagrangian corresponds to uh, just the free propagation of the, of the open string, which whose one end lands on the uh, ith brain in the stack, and the other end lands on the jth brain. And he, so here you have a splitting or joining. So you have three uh, boundary components in this diagram. And here you have the, uh, something which you can generate by composing things. I J, J K, K L. So these are the simplest interactions you can get. In fact, this one, from the open string point of view, this this is not an elementary interaction anymore. In fact, you can get it by uh, composing these these interactions. Infinitely closed sheets. Yeah. So the first picture, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. So so this is so in the true the the full Lagrangian which describes the, uh, the the interaction of strings contains an infinitely many more terms which uh, account for the possibility for the string to vibrate to have to have to, have, to be extended and so this is an approximation where the string is thin. Um, there are actually. Corrections which uh, account for it, the, the thing is, the, sorry, the, the crucial thing is not that it's thin, it's that, it's that it doesn't vibrate. It's, it's, it's in ground state. Because I will immediately I will add more terms which will describe stretch strings, which can uh, occur if you have these brains can separate. And so then you can have um, really large open strings which connect. D brains, which are which are uh, separated by by finite distance, and um, there is a mechanism in the in the kind of gauge theory which describes this D brains, which describes this phenomenon, namely, uh, yeah, okay, sorry, but uh, I wanted to I wanted to finish this line. So I have one is Young Mills theory, which is that kind of theory, and then there is its supersymmetric generalization. I will describe in some detail. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit confused. One second. And then the second standard gauge theory is the Chen Simons theory. Whose basic structure is even simpler. It has only the quadratic term and the cubic term. Yes, what is the question? So 
But this is this this Young Mills theory here is a theory of strings. So you are modeling the strings by this discrete gauge potential. It's an approximation. It's the it's the it's the theory of of strings which are not excited. Okay. And the Debra these these brands where do they appear? They are like. So so. Uh, well, you see, here you have to integrate this. In, you take this integral is integrate. Uh, it's the integral over something, over some space x, and the space x is where this is what these d-brains span. And uh, um, but so these d-brains are some surfaces in in uh, let's say ten, ten dimensional space time. So there is some transfer space, and so the, so the modes. Of these open strings, describe not only the uh, the particles of spin one along the along the which live on 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 this uh, space X, but they also describe other particles which f typically form a supersymmetric multiplet of some supersymmetry, and in particular they include typically they include spin zero particles, the scalars. Whose geometric interpretation is actually, uh, which have geometric interpretation. They they describe the, the the motion of this of these brains, in the transfer space. Um, so, uh, okay, let me skip the Chan-Simons theory for now. So the clean. So the simplest. D brain configuration is a stack of n parallel, uh, let's say, uh, well, DP, DP brains in type 2. theory and then uh, second a or B depends on the parity of P so it's uh, so if P is odd then this will be type to B and if P is even then it's type to a uh, so it wasn't left unintentionally un unspecified and then the low energy Meaning that uh, uh, open strings are not excited. Ground states. Description of that theory is the maximally supersymmetric. Young Mills theory. So this theory has uh, it's a Young Mills theory with a gauge group U n. So this n here. So this theory has a has a gauge field. So the, the 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 notation for the DP brain, uh, its world volume is actually Minkowski space of dimensionality one higher, and so we have a gauge field. So it's a gauge field. And if you can count how many components it has, it has p plus one component. It has uh, fermions, which have, in total, 16 real components. So they transform as uh, fermions of the Lorentz group, so spin 1, comma p, and also uh, as fermions, as, um, as sorry, they, so, so the spinners, 
the form of the irreducible presentation of this of the Lorentz group, and the form of the irreducible presentation of the transfers, the group of transverse rotations, uh, which is uh, nine spin uh, nine minus p. So the the picture which you have, which we should keep in mind, is that we have this p plus one dimensional uh, surface sitting inside the uh, ten-dimensional Minkowski space. So the symmetries, the symmetry of this uh, configuration are, is the Poincaré symmetry in this p plus one dimensional Minkowski space, and rotations in of the transfer space. So there is this. Second. Uh, you say sixteen. Is that for? A no, that's for that's 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 that should be for all uh, uh, for any p. So we'll we'll maybe we'll, we'll have. And this real fermions can I call them by a random fermion? That depends on the dimension. So in ten dimensions, for example, if this p, if p were equal to nine, they will be called Majorana of wild fermions. And in four dimensions. When p is equal to three, uh, we will take the wild, fer wild fermion of the, the usual uh, Lorentz group, which is uh, whose spin cover is SL two C. So they will transform into two complex dimensional representation of Lorentz group. And uh, for the transfer group, transfers group, uh, the group spin six, which is also SU four. So you would take a four dimensional, four complex dimensional representation. So you have two times four, that's eight, eight complex dimensional, which is 16 real dimensional. So they will be wild, but this, they will be wild, both wild fermions. So wild of one, three, wild of six. And uh, the last member of the supermultiplet is uh, our scalars, and scalars will have, so they have as many scalars as we have transverse directions. So we have nine minus p scalars. And so they transform, uh, so they transform as a vector of spin nine minus p. So, you, so if you think about this symmetry group then, the gauge field is a vector for the Lorentz group and the scalar for the transverse group. The fermions are the spinner, the minimal spin representation for both Lorentz and the transverse. And the scalars are singlets for the uh, Lorentz group and the vectors for the transverse group. OK. So, the, uh, so there is a, actually a unique Lagrangian which enjoys the maximal supersymmetry. And uh, this Lagrangian will contain I will now write it in more concise form. So there is a gauge coupling, which I will put in front of everything. So it contains the gauge connector term. The scalars connector term. The potential for scalars. The kinetic term for the fermions, and uh, there will be s there, there are the so-called Yukawa couplings. So things like the coupling of uh, well, my notation is not the the best, so there are also plus complex conjugate terms. Uh, so there are couplings between two fermions and the, and the scalar, and uh, all these fields. So A is a, is a gauge field, so it's locally it's a one-form value in the Lie algebra of the gauge group. And psi and phi uh, also uh, take values in the Lie algebra of the, of the gauge group. OK. So now, if, when you look at this Lagrangian, you can, uh, so there is a potential term, just the classical potential, and the minima of the potential 
Okay, maybe I should write it out more explicitly. So phi, as I told you, is a vec vector in this, uh, of respect to the transverse rotation group. So the commutator with phi with, with phi is the uh, in, is this, uh, it's an undersymmetric second rank tensor of, of the rotation group, and you have a sorry, you have a okay, just write it explicitly. <laughs> Okay, so the minima of this potential are the configurations where all the uh, nine minus p components of the scalar commute, mutually commute. And uh, we, we consider all configurations up to the action of the gauge group. And so you can simultaneously diagonalize them. So you'll have a bunch of eigenvalues, which you can combine into n vectors. And the geometry behind this uh, solution of the energy minimization problem is simply that you take your, the stack of n d brains and split it all, all while keeping them parallel. So, and so in the, the picture in the transfer space, this is uh, r9 minus p, that you have n endpoints in the space. These are these vectors phi 1, phi 2, phi n. And then uh, when you look at the, at the kinetic term for the scalars, in particular for the fermions, the, these Yukawa couplings for the fermions, you will see that uh, what looked like uh, a UN gauge theory originally will now look like a uh, uh, gauge theory with the gauge group U1 to the N plus uh, plus a bunch of massive fields so I should say that, you see, originally, the, when you look at this Lagrangian, um, it has no uh, mass scale in it. So uh, all the fields, if you expand this Lagrangian around the configuration on A and phi and psi are equal to 0, you will see massless fields in the amount n squared. And uh, now, when you expand about this configuration, where the scalars have the vacuum expectation value with generic eigenvalues, you will see uh, that you have only n massless fields, the diagonal components of the gauge field, the diagonal components of the scalars, and the diagonal components of the fermions. So I'm separating the color indices and the Lorentz indices. So these remain massless while the off-diagonal components, off-diagonal in the sense of UN representation, acquire a mass which you can compute actually from this Lagrangian, which will be equal to the distance between the, between the vectors phi i and phi j in transfer space. And that's, uh, this is the mass of the stretched, of, you know, of, the, of the stretched, this is the length, it's the length and, and therefore a mass of a stretched string connecting the i-th and j-th d-brain. So this is, 
So these off-diagonal modes, they actually describe the, the uh, dynamics of this. stretch strings. OK, so, uh, so this is the, uh, the theory which you typically get. Now, um, what if your G brains live not in a uh, flat space? So, so, for, so far, so this is a description of, of a stack of parallel G brains of one kind in the otherwise flat and empty space. Now, what happens if your space the ambient space is not empty, it's, it's not flat. What if it's curved? Uh, after all, Well, this is uh, where the quiver theory is coming. So typically, So typically, as a low energy description of the configuration of G-brains in the presence of some background curvature, uh, or maybe other brains of different types of brains, uh, you'll get a quiver gauge theory. So let's see how how can we understand that. I will do this. I will do this in two examples, maybe in three examples. Uh, when you write the phi ij, is that expanding about one of these? Because the phi was diagonal. So. Oh, sorry. So this is uh, okay. Uh, I should. So all all these modes are um, all these are fluctuations. So what I what I what I'm writing, I'm taking. Uh, I'm saying that a is uh, a naught plus delta a. Phi is phi naught plus delta phi. Psi is psi naught plus delta psi, where a naught, phi naught, and psi naught so uh, minimize the energy. So in fact, a naught equals to zero. Phi naught is one of these uh, diagonal matrices. Psi naught is also zero. And then for the fluctuations for delta a, delta phi, delta psi, you get a Lagrangian by substituting and expanding. And um, if your Lagrangian for some mode looks like uh, delta A Laplacian plus some non-zero non, uh, non -zero number, then we say this is this describes a massive field. So that means that it's a massive. Field of mass M. And so for the fluctuations in the in the Cartan direction, you will get just Laplacian for the quadratic uh, term of the action, and so it these are the massless fields. And for the fluctuations uh, in the root directions, you will get a non-zero mass term. OK. So uh, the simplest thing to do to make space looks cur look curved in string theory is to perform an orbifold. So orbifold. So suppose um, suppose the space time is now so it used to be a, uh, a Minkowski space and now I want to make it product of Minkowski space and the quotient of the uh, of Euclidean space Euclidean transfer space by some discrete group. So gamma is a discrete subgroup of the uh, of the group spin 9 minus p. Uh, 
well, uh, at the so if you know how your strings propagate on the regional space, it is actually pretty much straightforward procedure to formulate how will they propagate on the quotient of that space by a discrete group. Uh, the theory which we may, may get might look very different from what you start with. Uh, and in particular, you might um, create something which is called tachyon, some, some, uh, which is an instability. And so, what, so this solution, we, well, so the, the type of singularity which you actually create at the origin of the space may, be, may, 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 may turn out to be bad singularity. But for the classical considerations which I'm presenting now, this is irrelevant. It will be relevant once you start discussing the quantum properties of these theories. Um, so what kind of gauge theory will, will you get? So now I want to add n dp brains at, uh, so which will span the p plus one Minkowski space times the origin, times the singular point here. And so uh, I want to try and understand what type of, what kind of low energy description the open strings which end on these DP brains now that the transfer space is uh, orbifolded will have. So this is the first place where the modern string theory, I would say, encountered quivers. So this is, uh, I think this was understood uh, by Mike Douglas. And then uh, Douglas and Moore wrote a paper on um, on the particular case of, of uh, on this properties of a particular case of this construction where p is equal to uh, five, I believe. And uh, there is another interest. There is an interest in the uh, particular interest uh, among uh, some community of phenomenology and the people for these models when p is equal to three. This is called conformal phenomenology, I think, by Paul Frampton. Uh, I don't think it's been very successful in, in many respects, but uh, it's still interesting. And of course, there are mathematical, uh, mathematical applications, mostly in the cases where gamma is actually a subgroup of some unitary group, so which is strictly smaller than um, this uh, spin group. So when gamma special cases when gamma is, uh, belongs to a special holonomy groups. Special holonomy means uh, SUN, uh, SU, let's say K, G2, spin seven for P equals to uh, one, I guess. And uh, maybe I'm missing uh, the SP cases, some SP cases. But I think the, 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 the number of dimensions which are available to us here is, is bounded. So I think this, this exhausts all, all the possibilities. Actually. OK, so, uh, so what kind of theory will, shall we get? Well, it turns out that you get uh, out of uh, Instead of okay, instead of U N theory, which you might think you will have because you have N D P brains, so you have open strings which end on one of the other, so you have N squared possibilities for them. Uh, actually, the story uh, is uh, trickier. First of all, these N D P brains on the on the quotient space, if you Lift them on the covering space will look like uh, n times the order of gamma, because each point 
each point on the transfer space away from the singularity leads to, to absolute value of gamma points. So you might think that you'll have actually uh, that many brains and, and therefore that large of a gauge group. But that's also not true. So in fact, uh, and it's not true because you have some identification. So you have a string. So uh, I don't know how to draw this, actually. So this is the orbit. So this is my gamma orbit. And you have open strings which are connecting, let's say, one preimage to another preimage. Or each preimage also has a multiplicity n. So you can have i here and j there. But uh, because of the gamma action and, and gamma is treated as a symmetry, you would identify this string with, the, let's say, this string. So this is equal to. So we have some reduction of the number of, uh, of uh, independent degrees of freedom. And so in fact, uh, you will get the product over um, over some finite set, which I will immediately describe. You'll get a product of unitary groups where uh, I runs um, through the set of irreducible representations of gamma. So it's uh, gamma, uh, what's it, gamma dual or gamma? Uh, how do we, you know, okay, I don't know. Set gamma, I can call it gamma hat of the irreducible representations of gamma, and Ri is the dimension of the ith irreducible representation. So in fact, you will you will have to. Uh, so remember that the space of functions. The, on on um, on the discrete group decomposes u as a representation of gamma uh, decomposes into the irreducible representations with multiplicities which are equal to the dimensions of these representations. And um, now, so it's okay. So it's natural to now start drawing a diagram where the vertices would correspond to the irreducible representations. And so I just told you that the uh, gauge group of the resulting theory will be the product of ga or will be the product of unitary groups of those ranks. But now, uh, you see, in this, in the case where the gamma was trivial. We had the gauge fields, we had fermions, and we had scalars. And so the gauge fields, so what I just said implies that the gauge field will actually split. Uh, so you have the gauge field AI lives in the, in the algebra of that group. Now what about the fermions and what about the scalars? Well, it turns out that you'll have now um, two quivers in general. One which will describe the fermions, and one which will describe the scalars. Uh, they, uh, well, or these scalars were real. So these were, uh, well, real in one sense. These are anti Hermitian matrices. It's. Uh, or minus phi, OK. Well, so, so there's some reality condition. But now, um, once I do this proper projection on the gamma invariance, my scalars 
Well, this, there will be a reality condition like that, but it will involve matrices of now of uh, not necessarily a square type. So it will be. Okay, so uh, you draw two quivers, actually. So let me just say it. The, uh, the fermionic one and the bosonic one. And so how do you do that? Well, remember, I said that uh, I erased this, erased that. So remember that the scalars in the uh, theory without Orbi folding transformed in the vector representation of the rotation group. So let me denote by V the vector representation of the rotation group. So it's a representation of um, spin 9 minus p. And uh, therefore, it is a representation of gamma. Not necessarily reusable. So now, having v, we can do the following. For any representation, Ri, you can tensor it with V. And then we can decompose it into irreducible representations of gamma. And we'll get some multiplicities. So let me call them the, uh, the B multiplicities. And so I will now, so if I have an arrow I, uh, vertex I, I will draw B, I, J vertices connecting I with J. And so I will do this for, for all pairs of, for all vertices. And I will end up with some quiver diagram. Yeah. No, it could be 0, no, not negative number. OK, so that's for, and so uh, the, uh, the bosons, or the, sc the scalars of my uh, theory will live, actually, they will live in, uh, OK, so uh, how should I write this? So they will, they will correspond to the arrows of this diagram. I forgot to say that. So the actual quiver which I will get will be, uh, so the vector spaces which I assign to the, to the vertices are c to the n tensor ri. So this is the, sorry, um, sorry, not, 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 this is not right. c to the n ri. It's a, well, it's a vector space, it's isomorphic, but uh, the point is that it's a tensor product of the, uh, of the overall C to the n multiplicity space and the multiplicity space which you have in the decomposition of the regular representation. So this is not a representation, it's not a representation of, of the discrete group. That's, that's already taken care of by just labeling the vertices. This is just a vector space without, uh, with a Hermitian structure, actually. So this is assigned to the vector. Uh, this is assigned to the vertex i. Let me call it e i to, to distinguish from from this vector space v. So uh, so this is what my scalars are in in this theory. So they live on the on the arrows, and the, there are. There may be many of them because if you have many arrows. Uh, what, so what this uh, picture really represents, it's the, uh, in fact, it's, it's something which is uh, rather natural. Namely, you take, you take the uh, tensor product of, the, of C to the n and the regular representation of the group gamma, <coughs> 
you take homes from this space to itself. Tensor V, the spectral representation of the rotation group, and then you take gamma invariance. So this is what this is where the scalars leave. You see, original scalars phi plus reality, plus uh, hermeticity. So the the uh, the scalars phi here in the in the in the uh, maximally supersymmetric super case, we can think of them as being Hermitian Hermitian uh, matrices acting between c to the n and c to the n tensor v. So so phi had three indices, two indices which, which ran from 1 to n, and one index which runs from 1 to mi 9 minus p. And so you combine these two into this space, and this one is this space. And so in the presence of the orbifold, what you do, you first you enlarge n by the regular representation of the group gamma, and then you impose the gamma equivariance. And because of the gamma action, action on v, this is the structure which you will get. Okay. Similarly, you will build a quiver for fermions, which is uh, so now psi Where S is now, well, I don't want to write a general formula. It's something like C to the 2 to some power, which depends on P in some piecewise linear manner. Uh, so this is the uh, spin representation, minimal spin representation. Representation of. Uh, of the spin group and therefore of the group gamma. And so now you substitute S here. You'll get diff a priori different set of multiplicities. So get a different, uh, different quiver altogether. So the same vertices, but different arrows. Yes. Then you tensor it with the indecomposable, irreducible representation of the discrete group. You yes. Get yes. Now you, replace, you do the same thing with the spinner. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, and so that will give you the, uh, so the fermions will live here. So there will be a similar formula. Uh, Uh, except that the uh, reality of uh, of the original scalars here actually implies, uh, I think it implies symmetricity of the matrix B i j, but for fermions they, there is no symmetry considerations. So you, you may have Carroll, uh, what Fish is called, you can get a Carroll, Carroll theory where you have different number of fermions of uh, right and left chirality in space time. Okay, so that's a general. Uh, structure. Now, so these quivers will be different if the group gamma is a proper subgroup of, of the rotation group, which does not fit into a special holonomy group. However, if gamma does fit into a special holonomy group, then there is a relation between the uh, spinners and vectors. And in fact, you will get equivalent quivers. And so this is called the supersymmetric orbifold. So this is in this case the bosonic and fermionic quivers are equivalent. 
And so we don't, when people discuss quiver gauge theories, typically they talk about supersymmetric the field theories. And in this case, uh, the supersymmetry relates the bosons and fermions. And so it's, it's enough to specify one of these quivers to, to reconstruct the other. OK. OK, my time is up. So I don't, uh, uh, I didn't cover much. But uh, let me just say that uh, uh, you can further develop these uh, quiver gauge theories by replacing the orbifolds in the transfer space by conifolds in a relatively uh, cheap manner. So you can add something which is called superpotential. And geometrically, that means that you can represent. I want to say the same, but uh, I'm not sure. But uh, it, uh, one implies the other in a straightforward manner. Say again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's for sure. That's for sure. That's for sure. That's for sure. So uh, let me just uh, give you a small example, which hopefully will uh, illustrate the general point. So the simplest orbifold, which we can study are the orbifolds of uh, C2 mod gamma, where gamma is a subgroup of SQ2. So suppose the dimension of the transfer space is at least 4. So then you can mod out by the subgroup of, of spin 4, which is, in fact, the subgroup of SU2. And the simplest one is, is uh, Z2, which uh, reflects all coordinates. So this space. You can uh, view it as a cone. So C2 mod Z2 <laughs> So it's a cone inside uh, C3, where x, y, and z are the three invariants which you can build out of uh, Z1 and Z2. I guess Z, capital Z is Z, uh, Z1, Z2. And X plus IY is uh, Z1 squared. And X minus IY is uh, Z2 squared. And there's an I here. And I here is the square root of minus 1. So uh, now. So there is a gauge theory which which uh, will, which will you will get if you place uh, a stack of d phi brains at z equals z one z z two equals to zero, and as we discussed, so z two has two irreducible representations, the trivial one and the non-trivial one. So you'll get the You get a uh, well depends on nomenclature, but so you'll get that type of quiver gauge theory with two UN gauge groups and the so-called bifundamental matter. So it's a matter fields which are all this is called bifundamental. So the, the uh, fundamental with respect to EJ and the anti-fundamental with respect to EI. And uh, there is a deformation of the theory, which in the physics language is called the Fialeopoulos. Uh, term, and in mathematical language, this is called the uh, the level of the moment map, or the stability parameter. And so you can, and uh, in fact, because of the hyperkähler nature of this manifold, these parameters come in triplets here. So you can turn these parameters on and deform. So you can deform this to a smooth. Surface, an epsilon not equal to zero. So epsilon is the this Fayet-Leopold term. In fact, they, compl they complexify Fayet-Leopold term. Uh, 
So it's a deformation of the gauge theory such that it's uh, the space of low energy, uh, the space of minima uh, of the potential, like here, will be now this deformed space, deformed uh, singularity. But now you can do this deformation in a trickier way. So this epsilon is just a constant, but you can actually make different deformation. So replace an epsilon by a field. So there is a field phi. It's one of the scalars. So there is, there is an additional dimension to this problem. And so you'll get now not, not a single uh, smooth surface, but the whole family of the surfaces parameterized by, by the fourth coordinate. And so the total space is the conifold. This, it's a three-dimensional single Calabi Yau, which sits inside C4. And so you will get a theory which, which, is, which will look like the, uh, the mm, sorry, what I want to say. The, uh, the gauge group of this the resulting theory will, will be also UN cross UN. And in some sense, it will be described by the same quiver. But the, uh, there will be some difference in how you treat the, the, the field phi. You can integrate it out and just get the so-called quartix of potential. And so you, the bottom line is that the, the d brains on a conifold and more general Calabi-Yaus will also be described by the, by the quiver gauge theory with less supersymmetry and more, uh, more data, which I didn't uh, talk about, namely the superpotential. So non-trivial. So I think this will do for the introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Yes? I mean, I kind of understand what quiver is. Is there any applications? Any applications to something? Uh, <laughs> 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 no, literally. <laughs> this, this is the application of a quiver. <laughs> um, okay. The, the 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 main applications of uh, of uh, quiver gauge theory so far. I mean, the quiver gauge theory is uh, sort of uh, it's a uh, it's tower which is built on the quiver variety. So if you just look at the at the Lagra classical Lagrangian of this model and look at the space of uh, minima of the energy, you'll get some, some uh, variety, some, some manifold. And it turns out that by playing with the topology of that manifold, you can realize uh, various interesting algebras, like Youngians and uh, quantum affine algebras and, and, and uh, W algebras and many other things whose applications you know very well. So, so, the relate, so the geometric origin of these algebras gives you a handle, possibly will give you a way to compute some matrix elements of these algebras in these representations, and uh, gives other things. So in particular, the vacua, the, now not the classical, but the quantum vacua of, of such theories correspond to the beta states in the, in the, in the integrable quantum integral systems. And sometimes you don't know the exact spectrum, and here you can compute something. Or so there are, there are applications. So you mentioned three examples, but do you mention the other two? Yes. So 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 instead of a geometry, just a geometry in the transfer space, which is uh, 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 so I gave two examples: the orbifold and the conifold. You could also put brains, other other types of brains. Uh, D brains or the so-called Neuer-Schwarz brains, and uh, so it's a kind of a generalization of, generalization of geometry. Some so it's type of sing singularities which are allowed in string theory, and those also lead to to quivers. So uh, just to give a useful example, maybe. Um, so when you study the the D brains uh, with the transverse orbifold singularity, the the gauge theory. The quiver which you get 
in this case, are affine. But uh, if you just do the analysis of gauge theory, abstract gauge theory, you know that uh, the theories with the, let's say, finite thinking diagrams are also as good as the, as the theories with affine thinking diagrams. And so the question is, how do you realize the finite quiver, uh, finite quiver gauge theories in string theory? And so one, one realization involves two types of, of brains, so you put the so-called NS5 brains. And then uh, here you put some number of uh, finite, finitely stretched D4 brains. So D4 brains are allowed to end on an S5 brain. And so th this configuration of brains will, will correspond to the uh, gauge theory with a finite uh, A-type quiver, where the vertices would be uh, so the place, the uh, the space between the NS, uh, between the two NS five brains. So this is the quiver of that theory, and uh, the so you have uh, in your language, you this configuration corresponds to some particular assignment of the spaces V's and W's at each at each node. So that's uh, that's a construction. It can be by various string dualities. It can also be mapped to, to a geometry, but uh, it, it's, this is easier to, to talk about. Yeah, I'll mention that tomorrow. Yeah. This can be generalized to the D type. Uh, I'm not sure about the E type though. There will be some E. <laughs> okay. Good choice of the ordering of talks. <laughs> <laughs>